Good evening. I'm Patrick Lewis, Director of Collections and Research at the Bilson Historical Society. I'm so glad you joined us for tonight's presentation, The Most Hated Man in Kentucky. Brad Asher is an independent scholar, the author of Cecilia and Fanny, The Remarkable Friendship Between an Escaped Slave and Her Former Mistress, a book that's very special to Filson, and Beyond the Reservation, Indian Settlers and the Law in Washington Territory, 1853 to 1889. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. Please join me in welcoming Brad Asher. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that introduction. Appreciate uh, everybody logging in. Uh, in Louisville, it's a very icy night, so uh, I can't think of a better way to spend an ice storm than talking about the, the most hated man in Kentucky. Uh, before I get started, though, I would like to acknowledge a Filson guy who was uh, just instrumental in getting this book to the finish line, and that's Jim Pritchard. Uh, back when I first had the idea of researching uh, Stephen Burbridge, I found out that Jim had begun work on a, a, a biography of Burbridge in collaboration with a professor at Georgetown College. And for various reasons, they had kind of put their project on the back burner when I, when I just blundered onto the scene. So I really didn't want to step on any toes and I, I didn't want to compete if their project was, uh, was, was uh, well along. So I asked Jim if it would be okay if I you know, proceeded with my own research. And not only was he okay with it, he brought me two huge file boxes of Burbridge research that he had, uh, that he had already accumulated, uh, which filled gaps in my own research and opened some new avenues of inquiry for me. Um, Jim also read the entire first draft of the manuscript, so I, I just owe him a huge debt of gratitude for his assistance, and since I'm at the Filson, I wanted to publicly acknowledge that debt. So I actually think that The Most Hated Man in Kentucky is a great title, and I can say that without boasting uh, because uh, I did not come up with that title. Um, but one of the good things about it is that it invites people to kind of guess who the subject of the book is. Um, you say, what's the book? You say, The Most Hated Man in Kentucky, and they go, oh, who's that? Well, several people have guessed, uh, as you might expect, some of our current politicians, although the, uh, the particular politician usually depended on the partisan leanings of the person making the guess. And a uh, surprising number of people, given how much time has gone by, uh, guest former Duke University basketball player Christian Leitner. So uh, maybe, maybe that's the next project. Um, but no one guessed Stephen Burbridge. And I guess that kind of stands to reason. Um, after decades of being despised, Burbridge has uh, by now sunk into relative obscurity, known mostly to historians and students of the Civil War in Kentucky. However, if you'd been alive in Kentucky, in the last decades of the 19th century, there's little doubt that uh, Burbridge held the title of most hated man. And just to give you a flavor of how white Kentuckians thought about him, I just wanna read you a sampling of commentary on Burbridge from, from newspapers and from politicians from uh, the late 1860s through the 1880s. So quote, a paupered, lecherous, despised, and criminal outcast who will forever be denied rest in the hereafter. An imbecile with a weak intellect and an overwhelming vanity. That was the governor. Uh, a blood-stained tyrant, a demon in human shape. Those were uh, newspaper columnists. And one other newspaper writer uh, actually lamented that uh, someone he knew, a Kentucky gentleman, uh, lamented that he was a Christian because he had run across uh, Burbridge on uh, a Washington DC street and his uh, Christian ethics uh, prevented him from pulling his pistol and shooting Burbridge down in the street. So he was uh, dismayed that the man uh, was a Christian. So that hatred of Burbridge grew out of his time as military commander of the District of Kentucky, uh, which lasted from March 1864 to February 1865. During that time, he banned certain books and periodicals. He interfered in Kentucky's elections and its economy. He arrested and banished dissenters, and he executed prisoners in retaliation for acts that they had not committed. <clears throat> 
So for these and other reasons, most white Kentuckians loathed him. Now on its face, you could say they were justified in their hatred. Uh, we, after all, do not tend to favor clampdowns on civil liberties, election interference by the military, or summary executions. But the title of this talk is, or the theme of this talk, I guess, is Reconsidering Stephen Burbridge. So I want to see if he was uh, as basically as big a bastard as his black reputation suggests. Uh, so I want to look closely at the context in which Burbridge's actions were taken. And I want to question the motives of some of those who were so eager to fan the flames of hatred against him. And that's what I tried to do in this biography of Burbridge and what I'll try to do in the remainder of this talk. So a little bit of background on Burbridge. He was a slave owner, a son of bluegrass elites who came from a, a well-off family. His, family's, uh, his father's farm was one of the most valuable operations in Scott County, uh, where, where Burbridge was born in 1850. Uh, Stephen left Scott County and relocated to Logan County in the 1850s. And when the war broke out, he recruited the 26th Kentucky Infantry Regiment shortly after Lincoln's initial call uh, for troops. Uh, he moved pretty quickly up the ranks, making Brigadier General in June 1862, and he participated in the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, he seemed generally to have been a competent commander who, who uh, earned the respect of his men and the praise of his commanding officers. And he was officially named commander of the Military District of Kentucky on March 25th, 1864. That date is important if you want to put Burbridge's actions in context, uh, because in March 1864, Kentucky was a mess, to use a technical term. Kentucky was a mess. Uh, formerly a Union state, uh, it nonetheless had a sizable number of Confederate sympathizers among its white population. It was subject to an increasing number of attacks from guerrillas and Confederate cavalry raiders. And support for the Union cause was wavering among influential Unionist elites. So this was the situation in which Burbridge took command of the state. It's the conflict among Kentucky's Unionists that I want to talk about first. In our day, I think there is a tendency to associate the Union with abolition and anti-slavery. But many of Kentucky's Unionists were pro-Union and pro-slavery. In fact, they were pro-Union because they were pro-slavery. They had argued against secession in 1860 because they felt that the best way to preserve slavery in Kentucky was to stay in the Union. After all, the federal government had protected slavery until 1861 through law and policy. And to secede, they argued, would be to lose that protection and probably to lose slavery. And they won that argument. Kentucky stayed in the Union and most unionist slaveholders expected that the federal government would not endanger their slave property. The Emancipation Proclamation, uh, when it was issued, caused them to question that expectation, but the proclamation did not really touch Kentucky directly. And the provision that allowed enslaved people to enlist in the Union Army and thereby gain their freedom did not apply in Kentucky. By early 1864, Kentucky was unique among Union states in that it was exempted from the federal law that allowed Black enrollment and enlistment for military service. As a result, several thousand uh, Black Kentuckians left the state to enlist in neighboring states. And if they had been enslaved by fleeing and then enlisting, they gained their freedom under the federal law. So Kentucky's situation changes in February 1864 just as Burbridge is assuming command. Congress amended the Enrollment Act and it ended Kentucky's exemption from the uh, enrollment and enlistment of black troops. Soon after that, Kentucky failed to meet its draft quota with white troops. And as a result, Burbridge issued General Number Order, General Order Number 34 in April, instructing provost marshals in each district to quote, receive and regularly enlist as soldiers all able-bodied Negro slaves and free colored persons of lawful age who wanted to serve. Order number 34 was, was hemmed in by certain qualifications and some ambiguous language, but 
that ambiguity and restriction was soon blown apart by the number of African Americans uh, that flocked to recruiting centers to enlist and thereby gain their freedom. So there was a tremendous negative reaction to these developments among Kentucky's white unionists and a pronounced division developed between so-called conservative unionists and so-called unconditional unionists. Conservative unionists wanted no alteration of the original bargain. They supported the union and the defeat of the Southern Rebellion. They did not support emancipation or any interference with slave property. Those were the conditions under which they entered the war and supported the union. Those were the conditions they wanted to stick to. The union as it was and the constitution as it is was their rallying cry. Unconditional unionists, on the other hand, were willing to follow federal wartime policy wherever it led. If the defeat of the Confederacy required an assault on slave owning, then so be it. Preservation of the Union and restoration of the nation took precedence over a commitment to maintaining slavery. Burbridge was on the side of the unconditional Unionists, but he had not started the war that way. He had not started the war committed to emancipation. In fact, far from it. Early in the war, he was criticized by more abolitionist-minded soldiers from northern states because he would return escaping slaves who came into his lines to their owners, unionist owners, but, uh, but he would return and turn back uh, slaves that came into his lines seeking refuge. But as that policy at the federal level changed, and as he was commander of Kentucky in 1864, he was willing, as previous commanders had not been, to endanger slavery for the sake of the union cause. And so when he was charged with implementing the enrollment and enlistment of Kentucky slaves, he issued order number 34. And he followed through on that order too. He threatened punishments uh, for those who tried to prevent blacks from signing up. And he used black troops in the field uh, for garrison duty and most galling of all to white Kentuckians for recruitment. He put the abolition minded James Brisbane in charge of black recruitment and uh, as the leader of the 5th US Colored Cavalry, which was drawn from Kentucky, and he cracked down on conservative unionists who publicly complained about the policy. One of the most prominent conservative unionists so complaining was Frank Wolford. Now, some of you may know Wolford's story. Uh, he was wounded seven times. He was active in over 300 skirmishes. Uh, he was the dogged pursuer of John Hunt Morgan. So much so that when Morgan was brought to bay in Ohio after his 1863 raid, he sought out Wolford to offer his surrender. Wolford was a genuine Union war hero, but he could not countenance the idea of black soldiers. He denounced Lincoln as a tyrant. He called the enrollment of African Americans a violation of Kentucky's guaranteed rights and said any federal enrolling officer should be arrested under Kentucky's slavery statutes. And he even offered the services of his, of his own regiment to back up state officials if they made those arrests. When he made those statements, uh, he was uh, giving a political speech in Lexington and Governor Thomas Bramlett, who was another Union veteran and someone who had pushed for Burbridge to be appointed as commander, was sitting alongside Wolford on that stage as those threats were issued. So that was taken as Bramlett's agreement with those sentiments. And in fact, Bramlett himself considered issuing a call to Kentuckians to sue recruiters and pursue criminal proceedings in state courts against federal enrollment officers, promising to bring the whole power of the Commonwealth to bear in such proceedings. He was eventually talked down from this position by Burbridge and others during an all night meeting, but he continually complained about black enlistment and the way it was carried out, declaring at one point that, quote, Truly loyal men are not willing that the status of the Negro shall be made a condition of the restoration of the government. So Bramlett's statement there of what truly loyal men are willing to do and accept kind of inadvertently identifies the nub of the problem. What did truly loyal mean in Kentucky in 1864? For Wolford and Bramlett and many others, it meant a commitment to ending the Southern Rebellion full stop. Bring the Southern states back into the Union, but respect their existing property rights, 
including the right to own other people. Loyalty meant a commitment to the union as it was. Unconditional unionists viewed this as insufficient. In their view, the meaning of loyalty had changed by 1864 because the nature of the war had changed. Restoration of the union and ending slavery had become linked objectives. Both were bedrock aims of the war and therefore loyalty meant a commitment to both. In Kentucky, therefore, uh, acceptance of black enlistment becomes a kind of shorthand for loyalty to the union. In one of the loyalty oaths required of military contractors in Kentucky, for example, uh, an oath you had to sign if you wanted to do business with the military, the stipulations said not only that you had not given aid or comfort to the Confederacy, but also that you would faithfully support the acts of Congress and proclamations of the president having reference to slaves. Wolford, who was dishonorably discharged, arrested four times and uh, dressed down personally by Lincoln, was once offered a deal in which all the charges against him would be dropped if he pledged not to do or say anything that would, quote, hinder the employment and use of colored persons as soldiers. And Wolford refused the offer. So obviously, the use of black troops had become a litmus test uh, for loyalty. Nonetheless, conservative unionists loudly and regularly proclaimed their loyalty to the union, and they claimed that they were merely exercising their First Amendment rights to speak freely and criticize the government. They denounced Lincoln, they rejected the idea of black troops, and they criticized emancipation as a war aim. Needless to say, many of them campaigned for George McClellan in the November 1864 presidential election. To Burbridge and his military higher ups and to Kentucky's unconditional unionists, these actions looked an awful lot like disloyalty. Specifically, Wolford and his ilk were discouraging enlistments, sapping morale, emboldening rebels and guerrillas, and prolonging the war by doing so. Discouraging enlistments was illegal under federal law, and the state had a similar law on its books. And under Kentucky's Disloyal and Treasonable Practices Act, it was illegal to speak or write against the government of the United States in a way that excited insurrection or rebellion. In Burbridge's eyes, the actions of his opponents excited insurrection by encouraging the enemies of the government. And one of Burbridge's beefs with Governor Bramlett was that the civil authorities of the state did not seem to be enforcing the law. They didn't seem to be taking any action against these enemies of the government. So as military commander of Kentucky, Burbridge felt it was his duty to do so. And so he instructed his officers to arrest those who publicly opposed black enlistment and denounced emancipation. He threw some of these people in jail. He banished others beyond the Confederate lines. He demanded peace bonds from others uh, as a token of their pledge to stay quiet. In other words, they would sign a bond and give some money that said they would not oppose uh, or speak publicly about their opposition. And if they honored that pledge, they would get their money back. He and his officers barred certain people from running for public office because of their public stances against Lincoln's policies, but also because they wanted and needed cooperative local officials who were compiling the roles of those people who were eligible for enlistment and uh, were keeping tabs on Confederate sympathy in their districts. Burbridge's critics charge that many of these arrests, especially of the more prominent conservative figures, were done for partisan purposes, to help Lincoln's bid for re-election. And it's clear that partisan motivations played a part in the timing of the arrests and the eventual release of some of the detainees. But as even Lincoln said, he would have heard of a lot more arrests in Kentucky if people are arrested merely for opposing his re-election. As some of you probably know, uh, Kentucky is one of the few states that McClellan carried in November 1864. Uh, and, and, uh, and Lincoln was aware of that. Uh, and uh, Burbridge continued to make arrests even after the election. So there was obviously something more at work than just uh, partisanship. Uh, and he made arrests for speeches that he deemed treasonable. And it was these uh, arrests, post-election arrests, that finally kind of broke the camel's back for Bramlett. And he petitioned Lincoln quite strongly that Burbridge should be removed. <clears throat> 
So historians have long criticized Burbridge for this uh, clampdown on political expression and on civil liberties. And they have lamented his general lack of tact and forbearance. They've suggested that these uh, policies were to blame for white Kentuckians alienation from the union cause. And they've argued that a smoother man at the top administering the state with a gentler hand would have had greater success. But I think this is why examining the context of these policies is so important because unionist disenchantment with the war was not the result of Burbridge's policies. Rather, Burbridge's policies grew out of unionist disenchantment, specifically disenchantment with the turn towards emancipation. It's hard to see what policies Burbridge could have followed that would have brought conservative unions back into the fold short of just taking emancipation off the table, which was in fact what the conservative unionists wanted. But he was commander of the state, ordered con to control the expression of disloyal sentiments within his jurisdiction. He did his duty, and he has been well hated by Kentuckians for it ever since. So I haven't yet talked about the executions that were ordered by Burbridge, which uh, are a part of his uh, dark reputation. And I argue in the book that the critics of the executions need to be analytically separated from the critics of the crackdowns on civil liberties. The latter were largely fellow unionists who complained about Burbridge's policies as they were happening. These people, both the targets who are arrested and their friends and allies, disparaged Burbridge for his interference with free expression and with state politics but they mostly gave him a pass on the executions. After all, at the time, thousands of people were still dying on battlefields across the South. So the executions of a few dozen guerrillas uh, or Confederate sympathizers was not such a big deal. Critics of the executions, by contrast, were largely returned Confederates and Confederate sympathizers who vilified Burbridge after the war. While they weren't silent about the civil liberties issues, they consistently attacked Butcher Burbridge, they gave him that nickname, for his military murders, and they did it for generations after the war was over. So first, I wanna talk about the why and the how of Burbridge's anti-guerrilla policies and the executions that resulted, and then I want to look at the criticism of those policies. So Burbridge's problem was one that faced other Union commanders and commanders in other wars that have been waged by the United States. How do you fight an insurgency? Guerrillas attacked Unionist civilians, federal troops, and government infrastructure. They joined Confederate cavalry raiders. And afterwards, they often slipped back into the civilian ranks, aided by numerous sympathizers within the larger white population. The number of attacks also ticked up steadily during Burbridge's tenure as commander, especially after Burbridge's defeat of John Hunt Morgan at Cynthiana in June, because as Morgan's force disintegrated, some of his men followed their commander back to Virginia, but a significant proportion stayed in Kentucky to create havoc on what they called detached duty, kind of uh, freelance uh, guerrilla activity. Without sufficient troops to garrison and protect every vulnerable site in the state, and uh, he, Burbridge, like a lot of Union commanders, complained that he wanted more troops in the state, but never received them. And with deep, deep distrust between federal and state officials over the loyalty of the state militia, Burbridge relied on a kind of a mass and chase strategy when reports came in about guerrilla activity. So an attack would occur and Burbage would dispatch a squad from a nearby post to try to find and chase the offenders. Or he would pull soldiers from various posts and concentrate his forces to kind of confront the biggest threat. The guerrillas almost always had the initiative and the upper hand. In July, he settled on a new strategy to deter guerrilla attacks. And this was the infamous Order Number 59. This order required that officers select four prisoners at random from among the prisoners held by the military, take them to a site near where an attack had occurred in which an unarmed Union civilian had been killed, and then publicly execute those four prisoners. 
Over 60 people were killed through the workings of Order Number 59. Now, those killed were not responsible for the attack that had resulted in the Unionists' death. They had been apprehended for other reasons, for being a Confederate soldier behind the lines and away from his unit, for belonging to a guerrilla band that federal troops had encountered and captured, or for threatening or attacking Unionist civilians on their own. At some point, they had been picked up by uh, Union troops, given some sort of cursory investigation, and then forwarded to Louisville or Lexington or some other military prison to be held. Although Burbridge never laid out his thinking behind Order Number 59, I, I think we can discern the logic of it. He thought that guerrillas would refrain from attacks if they knew that the result of those attacks would be the death of their comrades. Of course, the problem with that logic is that not all guerrillas are comrades. Now, some leaders of irregular forces operating in Kentucky did make overtures to try and save their own men, but they didn't really care about the other men in federal custody. Guerrillas did not operate in a coordinated way or share tactics and strategies. So the idea that public executions of other people would deter them was wrong. And indeed, if you judge order number 59 simply on the grounds of effectiveness, it was a failure and guerrilla attacks were not curtailed. But Burbage's post-war critics did not attack his methods solely because they were ineffective. They did point this out, but their real complaint was that they were uh, what they called cruel and arbitrary violations of the laws of civilized warfare. In the words of Basil Duke, who was Morgan's second in command and who after the war through his writings was instrumental in fashioning a pro-Confederate lost cause view of the war in Kentucky, Burbridge was an insensate bloodhound who shot all the prisoners he could lay his hands on. So I want to shift focus now to these critiques and two of the main issues that Burbridge's critics pointed out. The first was the lack of due process for those who were executed. Burbridge maintained until the end of his days that the men who were executed had been subject to trial before a military commission. And a military commission is like a, it's, it's like a court martial, uh, but it's uh, done for enemy combatants uh, more often than for your own soldiers. It's a little less formal than a uh, fully uh, impaneled court martial. Proceedings before a military commission were supposed to be formally impaneled. The proceedings were supposed to be written down. The decisions were supposed to be approved by the commander, and then the records were supposed to be forwarded to Washington for review by the Judge Advocate General. It is safe to say that for most of the men held by Burbridge as guerrillas, in most of the cases, none of that happened. And when he was challenged to produce the records of these proceedings, Burbridge could not. And nobody, no scholar, myself included, has located with a couple of pretty important and notable exceptions, any of these formal records in the archives. What we have instead are hints of more casual proceedings convened on the spot by local commanders or of limited investigations conducted by soldiers who apprehended the prisoners. We also have newspaper accounts of prisoners being transferred from one prison to another, ostensibly for purposes of trial before a military commission. But without records of those proceedings, it's hard to know what those actually looked like and if they actually occurred. So the critics have a point. But I think we have to look again at the context of that criticism. And I think the emphasis on due process kind of borrows a concept from civilian law and drops it into this wartime situation. Because it suggests that those executed were being punished for a particular action for which they had been found guilty. And that's not what Order 59 is about. Those executions were meant to deter future actions by other guerrillas by retaliating for past actions against prisoners already in federal hands. Order number 59 never claimed that the men who died were shot because they were being held accountable for their own private actions. Unable to lay hands on those who were responsible Burbridge wanted to send a grisly and bloody message out to the men in the field for them to stop doing what they were doing. 
This concept of retaliation was valid under the laws of war as they were understood at the time. And in fact, retaliation is an accepted part of the law of war now. It allows an offended party who has been subject to an attack by an enemy that itself violates the laws of war to retaliate against enemy combatants in their hands as a way to deter further illegal attacks. Let me, so let me put that more plainly. It allows a violation of the laws of war by party A to retaliate for a violation of the laws of war by party B. In the union understanding of things, the guerrilla attacks were illegal and therefore retaliation was justified. And this brings us to the second point that was hammered home by Burbridge's foes. They insisted that the men executed were legitimate Confederate soldiers engaged in legitimate military actions. They were not outlaws, they were not guerrillas. This was just a convenient label to hide behind in order to carry out illegitimate violence against defenseless men who should have been treated as prisoners of war. But the legal context is important here. In response to his time fighting guerrillas in Missouri, Union General Henry Halleck had asked the Columbia University legal scholar Francis Lieber to examine the status of guerrilla warfare under international law. Lieber ended up producing an entire reformulation of the laws of war, the so-called Lieber Code, which was issued in April 1863, and that became the basis for Union actions during the war and for Burbridge's actions in Kentucky. The Lieber Code laid out a fairly detailed set of requirements for combatants to be considered legitimate soldiers and thus subject to treatment as prisoners of war. The fighters had to be uniformed. They had to be under a chain of command. They had to be uh, with orders specifying some military objective, and they had to have the manpower necessary to accomplish that objective. It categorized those who did not meet these requirements under a variety of titles, like armed prowler, squads of men without commission, war rebels, but it clarified that these men were liable to trial by a military commission, imprisonment, and execution. Now, Adam Johnson, who was a leader of irregular forces in Western Kentucky, complained and did not like that he was, quote, being branded by the Lincolnites as guerrillas. And he insisted that he and his men were regular soldiers in the Confederate Army. But when he tested that premise, when he went to parlay over order number 59 and sent a message to the Union commander in Louisville, uh, who, uh, who had been appointed by Burbridge, the commander rebuffed him and told him he was heading a, quote, small force composed of irresponsible men distant from Confederate lines. And thus he could surrender, he could turn himself in, they could all turn themselves in individually, but he had no right to represent himself as a Confederate officer who could parlay on equal terms with a Union officer. So it is true that among the list of those executed under Order 59, there are several who were members of various Confederate military units. For Burbridge's detractors, this meant that all were legitimate combatants and should have been treated as prisoners of war. It did not matter that these men had been picked up behind the lines. It did not matter, did not matter that they had not been with their unit when they had been apprehended. It didn't matter that they were not wearing the Confederate uniform when they were taken. In the eyes of Burbridge's critics, anyone who had enlisted in the Confederate Army at any point and in any place was deemed to be a legitimate Confederate soldier. But this was not how Burbridge or Burbridge's superior officers saw them. In the Union's understanding, attacks carried out by small groups of armed men not under the Confederate Army's chain of command were violations of the laws of war. And the participants in those attacks, even if they were enlisted soldiers, were subject to apprehension and retaliation, including execution. As an officer in the Union Army and commander of Kentucky, Burbridge had a duty to enforce the law as, as it was understood by the Union. Charged with controlling the attacks of guerrillas and of irregular forces in Kentucky, he undertook measures that were undeniably harsh, but measures that were within the bounds of the law. His actions were also largely within the bounds of military precedent as these were understood by Union officers. Union commanders were bedeviled by Confederate guerrillas in various parts of the South, 
as well as in the border regions of Missouri and West Virginia. And like Burbridge, these commanders used collective community punishments when the guerrillas could not be apprehended. The most notorious instance perhaps is when uh, commanders in Missouri ordered the evacuation of an entire section of the state uh, to clear out all guerrillas and civilian sympathizers by just emptying the counties. And they also resorted to summary executions. So Burbridge borrowed from an existing toolkit. As I said at the beginning, uh, the title of this talk calls for a reconsideration of Burbridge and in much greater detail in the book, I have tried to prompt this consideration by looking more closely at the context in which the clampdown on civil liberties and the executions took place. But it's also pertinent to reconsider those who cultivated the hatred of Burbridge, who attached the epithets of tyrant and butcher to him. And these were largely returned Confederates supporting a lost cause view of the war and their allies among disaffected Kentucky Unionists. Now, historians have studied for a long time white Kentuckians' embrace of the lost cause. The lost cause, as I'm sure most of you know, extols the gallantry of the Southern soldier. It criticizes the brutality of the Northern armies. It celebrates the patriotic motivations behind the Southern struggle for independence. And it laments the misguided objective of freeing the enslaved people of the South. This view became dominant in Kentucky after the war. And, here, I feel almost obligated to quote uh, the historian E. Merton Coulter, who said kind of famously, a locally famous aphorism in Kentucky, back from 1926, he wrote that Kentucky waited until the war was over to secede from the Union. What Coulter described has since been studied by more recent historians who examine the way public memory of major events is constructed. These writers focus on the cultural work that is required to accomplish what Coulter described. In other words, the way we remember our shared history doesn't just happen, it takes effort. And when an event is remembered in a particular way, it generally means that there has been a significant amount of effort both to building up that memory and shunting aside to the margins other ways of remembering that event. So I would argue that a significant part of the effort to enshrine a lost cause inflected view of the war in Kentucky involved blackening the name and reputation of Burbridge. Hatred of Burbridge, in other words, was part of the pro-Confederate cultural memory project. So in addition to the normal stuff of Confederate memory, statues to the Confederate dead, the celebration of Confederate leaders with ties to Kentucky like Morgan and Jefferson Davis, regimental reunions and picnics and the formation of local branches of Confederate heritage organizations, all of which we had in Kentucky, there were Burbridge specific commemorations as well. Martyrs monuments were erected in various locales to commemorate those who had been executed under order number 59. Reinterments of some of the victims of the executions uh, also took place with processions and speeches by local notables. Days of mourning were declared uh, when these reinterments occurred. And stories of Burbage's misdeeds were consistently rehashed in the press and then in local histories. All of this was meant, uh, in the words of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, to keep fresh the memory of Burbage's infamy in the minds of white Kentuckians. And by keeping fresh the memory, it reminded them of the oppressions they had suffered at the hands of the Union Army. It linked to those oppressions to the much vaster suffering of the defeated South, and it energized the political criticisms of the post-war Republican Party and the policies of Reconstruction. So let me give in the time remaining just one example of this Burbridge strategy uh, that I find particularly interesting. So in 1866, pretty soon after the war, there was an election for clerk of the Court of Appeals, which is a pretty minor office. And it pitted Edward Hobson, a former Union general who had served under Burbridge and was backed by the Republicans and the Conservative Union Party against Alvin Duvall, a Democrat who had fled the state earlier, earlier in the war when threatened with arrest by Burbridge for disloyal sentiments. But if you read the coverage of this election, you could be forgiven for not knowing who Duvall's opponent was. 
because in story after story, what mattered was what Burbridge had done to Duval and to Kentucky. Thank God we have no Burbridge now to dictate to and rule over us, read the Courier's endorsement of Duval. Another partisan wrote that the election will turn upon the relative merits of Burbridge and Duval. And he warned voters that in the great case of Burbridge versus Duval, it will look very badly to see your name on the Burbridge side of the ledger. The sins of Burbridge, and thus by extension Hobson, were then also tied to the post-war sins of the Republican Party. Summarizing the crackdown on civil liberties and the executions under Burbridge, a Lexington paper wrote that the supporters of Hobson include every Burbridge man, every Freedmen's Bureau man, every civil rights bill man, every man who is for the pending Negro Equality Amendment, by which they meant the 14th Amendment. Needless to say, Hobson lost the election convincingly. The constant recycling of grievances against Burbage's wartime policies, the smearing of his reputation and that of anyone associated with him, and the linking of his wartime policies to the Republican Party and its post-war policy, all helped push white Kentuckian sympathies in a distinctly pro-Confederate direction. And it was very successful. The Democratic Party, led by ex-Confederates, came to control state government for the next several decades. Burbridge was eventually hounded from the state, and white Kentuckians firmly embraced the lost cause version of the Civil War. Kentucky is, however, moving on from the lost cause, maybe. Some Confederate monuments have come down, and current day historians have been thoroughly challenging the rosy view of the Confederacy contained in earlier works of Kentucky history. So maybe it's time to move on from the general contempt for Burbridge as well. If we place his wartime actions in the proper context, we find that much of the hatred directed at him was a reflection of white Kentuckians hatred for the end of slavery. His critics expected Burbridge to facilitate a debate over the legitimacy of the wartime policy of emancipation. And they were angered when he insisted that there was no debate to be had. The wartime emergency demanded a certain standard of loyalty. And if that was not met, he was charged with enforcing the consequences. The executions, as repugnant as they are to modern sensibilities, were legal responses to an illegal insurgency convulsing the state. They were in line with policies pursued by Union commanders in other areas and they were sanctioned and approved by Burbage's commanding officers. The attempts to transform them into illegitimate military murders carried out by an aspiring dictator was largely a post-war ideological ploy by those eager to portray Union wartime measures and Republican post-war policies in the worst light possible. The long hatred of Burbage is a measure of their ideological success. And the current reinterpretation of that ideology may finally pull the black cloak off Burbridge himself and allow modern students of Kentucky Civil War history to gain a new perspective on the most hated man in Kentucky. So that's all I have. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions that have come up in the chat uh, and uh, I'll, I'll answer them the best to, to the best of my ability. Well, thank you so much, Brad. And and as as one of those Civil War historians, uh, I have to say how how long we have been waiting for this book, and I really appreciate <laughs> that uh, uh, that a a figure like Burbridge uh, fell into your hands. We've got some questions in the chat already. I encourage the audience to to put some more in if you do have them as we go along. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, something you mentioned there at the end about him being uh, hounded out of the state um, and and. Uh, we can think of a number of other uh, unconditional unionists who move from sort of conservative unionist and, and gradually drift over towards being Republicans, thinking of George Yeaman or uh, uh, Benjamin Helm Bristow, who likewise don't find it too comfortable at home uh, after the war. What happens to Burbridge? So uh, in, a, in a lot of texts I read, uh, it said that he never set foot in the state again after the war. But that is actually, I found that wasn't true. He, he, uh, he was active in Republican politics for a few years after the war until it became obvious that he was a liability to Republicans. And he worked for a few years uh, in Covington as a claims attorney. Um, uh, 
But then uh, his wife died uh, sometime around 1870 or 71. Um, and uh, his brother had been killed in a dispute. Uh, another brother had had a run in with some uh, sympathizers, uh, Confederate sympathizers who were angry at what uh, Stephen had done. And so things were getting unpleasant and he eventually relocated to Washington DC and was in the Washington DC, Philadelphia area, uh, usually angling for some kind of patronage appointment to the federal government and never got one. You know, every time he came close, there would be this kind of outrage of criticism from Kentucky's uh, congressional delegation that said, if you give him this position or that position, mm. we, won't, we will not stand for it. So he never successfully got a, 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 a patronage reward for his loyalty to the union. But he did find a wealthy widow in Philadelphia that he married uh, in uh, 1873. Uh, they went on a two year honeymoon to Europe. Um, and when he came back, he lived for a while in Philadelphia, in Saratoga, New York, uh, and he died eventually in 1894 in Brooklyn. And he's buried now, he's buried in Arlington. In Arlington. Well, I guess if you're going to be a Kentuckian in exile, Saratoga is not the worst place. No, to, that's, uh, to right. Be. that's right. That's <laughs> right. Um, we've got a really great question uh, glancing forward into, uh, into Reconstruction a little bit in the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, does, uh, does, uh, if Burbridge is the most hated man in Kentucky, is Clinton Fisk, for whom Fisk University is named, uh, uh, the second most hated man? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, he, I, you know, he, the Freedmen's, even though Burbridge was only in charge for a year, uh, he earned so much uh, wrath and hatred that uh, Fisk may be the second most, but at the, at the point that the Freedmen's Bureau was operating, it was already under assault by uh, the Democratic-led government of the state, which had, you know, kind of restored Confederates uh, to uh, without any uh, prescription. Um, they had started taking over the levers of state government, so Fisk didn't quite have the power that Burbridge did. But Fisk was definitely not well liked and was called before the legislature at least a couple of times to answer for. Uh, for, for accusations that he made against the uh, the good people of Kentucky. Well, I think it's really interesting, um, you know, and, and talking about specifically, as you mentioned, this moment that Burbridge takes command in the state, uh, you know, passions are so high in March of 64, and, and there really isn't a, a, a crazier time in Kentucky politically. Even 1861 has nothing on the spring of 64. And, you know, Burbridge is, is um, is remembered in this white hot passionate way and the man who actually brings down slavery continues to, to prosecute the guerrilla war very fiercely John Palmer for the next year in 1865 gets a free pass yeah he's not Palmer's not well liked either but he doesn't get the uh he doesn't get the kind of vitriol that, that accompanies Burbridge and I think part of that is because Palmer's from Illinois he comes in, he, he, he was kind of known as an abolitionist beforehand. Um, and then he goes off out West and does his thing out there. And so he is like, uh, uh, I, I almost, he's kind of, he, he's kind of like a carpet bagger to use an old fashioned term. Whereas Burbridge gets the hatred, I think, because he's a native Kentuckian. He's one of their own. He came out of that bluegrass gentry. And so for him to do this, earns a special uh, a special place in hell uh, for for white Kentuckians, I think. I think that's one of the reasons. But you're right. Palmer does a lot of the exact same things that Burbridge does and, and doesn't have near the, uh, the Black reputation. We've got a couple of really excellent questions um, about, uh, about sources and Burbridge's own words. I'm going to roll them into one. Uh, and maybe you can give us a, a, a bigger overview of what you had to work with archivally, asking specifically about any of his writings on his thoughts about slavery um, and how they might have evolved. And then also, did he ever publicly react uh, to this reputation after the war that he was gaining? Uh, so in terms of the uh, material in the archives in Burbridge's voice, there's very, very little. So it, it's very frustrating. You don't really know what's going on in his head uh, at the time that he issues these orders. Um, 
there are a few letters back and forth. Uh, actually, they're not back and forth. They're from his brother to him after the war is over. Uh, there are his official reports uh, that are and orders that are published in the uh, uh, the official records. Um, there is uh, uh, some wartime correspondence that the Filson has um, from uh, that period and also uh, from after the war. Um, and there's some uh, there's a collection at Duke University of uh, of, of orders and telegrams uh, received and sent by Burbridge, but they're all official communications. I mean, ninety percent of it is official communication, so it's not it's not uh, confessional. It's not uh, agonizing over uh, what what he's doing. Um, so, I think the best and I guess the reason to hit on his unconditional unionism, and I think that's the best explanation of where he stood, he, I don't think he truly, he's not a kind of abolitionist hero in the sense of, uh, of a Sumner or a, a, a Stevens, you know, he's not out there from the get go. Um, he rather, he kind of believes strongly in the union and if the, and, and believes strongly in, uh, you know, following, doing his duty and if duty to the union requires emancipation, then he will go there. And when duty to the union early in his career required not honoring emancipation, he went there. He was more of a unionist than he was an emancipationist. And the second part of the question, uh, refresh my memory on it. Sorry, I talked too much. Does he ever uh, publicly respond to the, the criticism of the reputation? <laughs> He does, uh, and he has numerous kind of public feuds in the press uh, with uh, people who um, who uh, are angry about it. And his public reaction is is generally, "I did what I had to do." In fact, a couple of times, numerous times, he says, "I was not harsh enough," given the level of Confederate sympathy in Kentucky. Um, uh, I was uh, I followed my orders um, and. Um, the I have been attacked always by this resurgent Confederate sympathy in the state. So he was not apologetic for what he did during the war, always felt he was in the right um, and uh, was more than happy to spar with his opponents in public. But I should say that is, at least from his public writings, that is the kind of personality he has. There are at least four different times in his life when he challenges people to duels because they have insulted his honor. So he views, I think, these neo-Confederate assaults on his policies as a kind of an attack on his honor. And so he is, he is defend, he avidly defends himself. Our very own James Longstreet going down <laughs> swinging against his, uh, his former compatriots. Um, We've got another question in here. Uh, you didn't mention the great hog swindle, no. um, which is another black strike against him that we can kind of chuckle about now. But it, but it, but it, it, it impacts Kentuckians' pocketbooks at a time when, uh, when times are tight. Tell us about that. So I, I don't. The hog order is in the book. Would have to be, of course. Um, so the hog order was uh, uh, a, 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 an order by Burbridge that the military essentially had first claim on uh, Kentuckian pork farmers' pigs, um, and they had to be routed to certain military-linked packers, and those packers paid two cents a pound less than the pork farmers uh, could get if they sold them on the open market to uh, to any of the other packing houses. So. That order went into effect, I believe, in October of 1864. It caused such an outrage that uh, Burbridge was ordered to rescind it a month later. So it only is in effect for a matter of weeks. Um, so I think the kind of uh, the brouhaha over it is a little overhyped. Um, and so that's why I didn't include it in the talk. But it is significant for Kentucky's pork farmers because they do, according to uh, Bramlett, they lost about $300,000 during the operation of this because the federal government was buying their pork for less than open market prices. At the same time, there was an article written back in the 60s that looked at the hog order in the hog market. And uh, he argued that uh, 
the, in fact, there had been a kind of collusion, collusion among the packing houses and that was driving up the price of pork artificially as a couple of big ones tried to corner the market and that the federal government actually was having a hard time procuring pork to feed the soldiers. So in that way, the order becomes a little more understandable to meet a, a crisis of uh, provisions for the army. Um, and this guy, I, and I can't verify all his calculations, um, but this guy argued that it saved the army $200,000. So it cost the farmers 300,000, saved the army 200,000, um, was designed to meet a, a, a food crisis for the army, but you're right. It hit Kentuckians uh, a place where it hurt most at a time when they could not afford it. And that was, it was definitely a, a damning mark against Burbridge. You know, and I, I spent uh, far too much of my life reading uh, Tom Bramlett's incoming correspondence. And, uh, <laughs> and, and from around that time, I remember quite a few folks who, who complained about it, now whether they, they were actually as impacted as they suggested they were to the, the governor, who knows. Um, but, uh, but it really did seem to, and I think we sort of discredit, um, you know, as we focus so much on this anger over emancipation, we discredit how much this imposition of these war taxes not only at a federal level, um, but but at a at a, a state and a county and a city level, everybody's you know putting in new um, you know taxes on everything and price controls, and this is a, a brand new imposition of governance that yeah. is is quite uncomfortable. Well, and if you think about the other side of it, about how much money there is to be made by selling things to the army then if you're on the outside of that, whether through loyalty oaths or through what you perceive as political favoritism or for whatever reason, that is another economic hit that you're taking from one of the ways that it is possible to make money off the war. So not only getting hit by the taxes, but if you're on the outside of the, uh, of the contractors, then you don't have the opportunity to recoup that by getting it back from the government. So that also generated a lot of anger by the, uh, the boards of trade and the other things, the other licenses that were required to trade with the government. I think that's really one of the, the, the places for ongoing research too. And, and what are these little micro markets that pop up um, in Kentucky and elsewhere as the, the war shifts and changes and what opportunities do people see and try and shift uh, you know, agricultural production into? Yeah, at a time when, you know, uh, there are guerrillas roaming the countryside and federal troops. And so it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to know that whatever you start raising in, in, uh, in April is even going to be around in October for you to turn a profit on. Very uncertain times. I, I, I agree. I think that kind of local level microeconomy research is a, is a fruitful area for exploration. Turning real quickly to the guerrilla war, I wonder, and, and you know, you, you point out so well that these are, are perennial challenges that anyone facing this sort of insurgency has to deal with. Um, for a long time, Kentucky, after the Perryville campaign, was seen as a military backwater. Um, are military historians paying attention in light of uh, the past couple of decades of the, the sorts of conflicts that the U.S. Armed Forces have been in? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, uh, I think... Uh... Uh, there has been a great deal of work on the guerrilla conflict, on stressing the importance of the guerrilla conflict, on the importance of Missouri and Kentucky and the border states to the general union war cause and how uh, it is so different than the kind of uh, grand Ken Burnsian civil war narrative of big set piece battles and you know, Lee versus Grant or Sherman versus Johnston, that this kind of local level, uncontrolled uh, 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 local violence is really uh, kind of a key to understanding the war. And there has been a lot of great work uh, done on that, I think. And, and that I will probably continue because I, I don't know how many more books can be written about the first day at Gettysburg or, you know, the second day or whatever, uh, but there's lots of work that could still be done on, um, on the guerrilla conflict and particularly on the way that those uh, irregular activities were related to the use of black troops and emancipation, um, whether that increased the, the urge to go out in the field and, and, and fight and the kind of 
a brutality with which uh, black soldiers and, and uh, uh, were treated when guerrillas came across them. So I think there's a lot of exploration there as well. Well, that's all, all the time we've got. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Uh, Brad Asher, thank you so much uh, for The Most Hated Man in Kentucky, uh, a book that, as I said, we in Kentucky have been needing for a long time, but I think you've also just made the case uh, for, for National Civil War Scholarship to, to take a look. Thank yep. you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks everyone for logging in. I appreciate your attention. Uh, have a great evening. Bye everybody. <laughs>